Well, I think my practice has going has been going well, actually. Um, yeah, we spoke about two weeks ago, I think, because last ah. week you weren't feeling too well. So, um, yeah, I mean, in terms has of has it been a week already? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm having a hard time finding finding time in the morning because of the time difference um, during the week. So it's it's much easier for me to call on the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, my formal practice is actually going pretty good. I'm doing kind of a mix of a bit of different things. Um, one thing I'm really, one thing that's going especially well is gladdening the mind. Ah. So my mind has has gladdened itself a bit. <laughs> um, yeah, especially uh, yesterday I was doing a sit and I just started feeling ex like I wasn't doing meta or anything. And I started feeling extremely grateful for everyone who's supporting me in this whole thing I'm doing, like this whole Dharma thing. Mm -hmm. And I just had this moment of like, ex like intense appreciation and love for all who are teaching and helping others. Um, that just came out of nowhere. And nowhere you say. <laughs> I didn't said, cultivate said, it. <laughs> I didn't cultivate said it. Yoda the, the Jedi. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't. I, I didn't mean for that to happen. That, um, yeah. Apart from that, another thing that's that's pretty nice is I'm getting a lot of. I used to have a lot of tension in the body when sitting, and that's getting much better I think both in terms of posture and in terms of getting into a relaxed and calm state which okay. is which is quite pleasant so those that's that's about all I can think of right now Well, first off, I would I must say, congratulations, that your practice is bearing fruit, and that um, though I haven't spent a lot of time talking about gratitude, gratitude goes in hand in hand with with generosity, and that when generosity um, is received with gratitude, then both sides benefit greatly. Um, and an example where that doesn't work is if someone writes a check, puts it in the mail to, say, the Red Cross, or even goes into the Red Cross office and gives the money there because the woman behind the desk that, that gets the money is actually not getting the money, and so there's no, no actual gratitude there. That uh, That's one of the major differences, I guess, between the generosity that you see practiced in the vest versus the generosity-gratitude combo that is generally done one-on-one. -on -one. That, in fact, I have enormous <laughs> gratitude for uh, Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa and Achan Po. In fact, I was just over to see Achan Po just on the 25th of, of February now, so it's just been a little over a month since I was there. And I still have great gratitude for them both, primarily because of the one-to-one -one relationship that I had with them and that the uh, the Dhamma was uh, let us say freely given sometimes yeah. with a bit of trickery 
but the trickery actually was quite beneficial. Uh, trickery in the sense that Ah Chun Po would have, he would take the opportunity to stand outside the cootie and wait to see how long it took me to figure out that he was out there. But I guess he stopped doing that right after I started figuring out every time he came that I was Johnny on the spot. He says, okay, now he's got the training. So that's the kind of thing that that I have with them that somehow or another through the internet and through Skype, we should be able to have that also, that kind of relationship. Because gratitude for the Dhamma is an enormously valuable thing, partly because the gratitude is based upon the fact that you have been given quite valuable gift. That we don't just spontaneously have gratitude if what we're grateful for is no big deal at all. Yeah. Um, that we have to, let us say, uh, we have to see the value in something before we can be grateful for it. And one of those things would be breathing. We do breathing so automatically that we don't understand that every breath is a breath of life. If we don't breathe, we die. And that happens really fast. <laughs> yeah. Within a minute or two, out we go. And so um, from time to time, I even will recommend a student from time to time to hold your, hold your breath and see and, and hold it as long as you don't want to breathe. But when you start to want to breathe, in other words, when you recognize that you, hey, you really like this breathing thing, <laughs> maybe, and then we can take a breath. That gives us the idea that, oh, the breath is actually quite valuable. It needs to be paid attention to. Yeah. I learned mm. that recently when I had a cold. And <laughs> I mean, I could breathe, but it was really uncomfortable. And my nose was all stuffed up. It's kind of the you don't know what you you don't appreciate what you have until it's taken away kind of deal. Like I never appreciate like my right wrist, but if I were to break it, I would sure <laughs> think it was nice to have it like. Exactly so. Exactly. Um, we could also extrapolate that to various aspects of uh, the teachings of the Buddha, starting right off, right off with suffering. That one of the reasons why people are willing to put up with suffering is that they don't see suffering as actual suffering that they're creating. They think that it's something that comes along with the package. But when they begin to see what suffering actually is, then they want to start paying really close attention to it so that they can get rid of it. To not, not, uh, not to take it on unintentionally because we're ignorant to the devastation that we create for ourselves with our own suffering. So from that we can start breaking that down into also feelings, for instance, that we don't in the beginning recognize the value in knowing feelings as they arise. But as we begin to figure out, oh, if I can see feelings as they arise and are wise to that stuff, now I can choose how to feel rather than being driven by the feelings. For instance, most people, when they when they encounter something that they really don't like, they'll either uh, try to get rid of it, or get angry at it, or uh, have a pity party. All of that stuff is a form of suffering. But if we're a wise to, oh, I have the feeling of not liking. Let me deal with that feeling. Let me gladden the mind. And oh, am I happy? that I was able to see that negative feeling before I actually did get angry. So ignorantly, the, the feeling I don't like it is going to lead quickly to anger, especially if you're in conversation with someone. 
Yeah. So in that regard, when that bad feeling comes up or that negative feeling, the right thing to do right then, if we have mindfulness, is to shut the mouth. Don't talk. Yeah. Be quiet. Take a deep breath. And be Can happy. Actually... Wow, I'm really <laughs> glad I saw that stuff because otherwise I was about to get into an argument with my friend here. Yeah. <clears throat> I've got a, I've got a um, slight question about that. And okay. Um, I guess another possible strategy in that situation that is often recommended is to fully feel the feeling, for example, in the body. So let's say I'm talking to someone, anger is coming up, instead of gladdening, or maybe not instead of, but another thing that could be done is to kind of direct attention to the body and see where that anger is in the body and just kind of take that as an object of um, investigation and see what's going on there. Do you ever, I don't think I've, I've heard you talk about it in that way. Um, I'm not against that. It depends upon the time frame. But the time frame should be your choice. And the longer it takes you to respond, for instance, to someone else's anger, the more likely you're going to respond in a way that does not feed back into the anger. And this has been known for so long. Um, an example would be to tell somebody to count to 10 or to cool off. In Thai language, they say, Jai Yan, Jai Yan. We would also say, settle down, settle down. But these are words that are coming from someone else. Because the guy himself, who is just on the verge of anger or just about to explode, he doesn't know that because he's not aware of his own feelings. All right. So that, that deep examination that you're talking about does have some benefit but I would also warn against wallowing in it because that's not useful. The best thing to do is to identify it, note it well, and let it pass. Mm -hmm. So don't take too long before you take a deep breath. And also okay. we begin to get used to that. I mean, you've had those feelings all your life. And you just hadn't paid attention to them. Now you're paying attention to them. That's what's new, not these feelings. You already kind of know what they are. And so it shouldn't take you long to figure out that, um, um, that these various feelings occur in various parts of the body, but that they, it's normally in the, in the central area. Mm-hmm which is exactly where the old Hindus talked about where the chakras are. Those are where the feelings are. And so you can actually name the chakras all except for the top two, the crown chakra and the uh, third eye chakra, and forget about those. And then all the other chakras are where all, like for instance, <laughs> there's so much about it. Um, the neck area uh, is a place for protection. That, that when a predator goes in to the, for the kill, he goes for the neck. So if the animal can protect his neck, he can. And so you, you also see in ancient warfare, one of the major things about it was is that they'd pile all kinds of stuff up on the shoulders so as to protect the neck. We can also see in modern times where people will put their shoulders up in a, in a way of protecting themselves. They also get a very tight neck. In fact, in the United States, they have the term redneck, but that does not come because the guy's out in the field in the sun. Oh, it's not? No. The redneck comes from the hatred of the blacks. Huh. The anger, the okay. tension, the strength, the redneck. It so means the front, someone who so is So the front angry. of the neck is red from anger and not the back it, of the neck from the sun. Yes, exactly so. <laughs> or actually, it's just all over. <laughs> but it's not specifically from sunburn. Okay. 
I don't know where that idea came from, but the old original idea of redneck was somebody who was just really hot. Huh. Didn't know that. Also, anger will tense up the whole body. You'll feel tension in the arms, which sometimes yeah. will make fists. So there's a lot of things that can happen in the body as anger builds up. But what we're better to look for is not anger as it builds up, but more the subtle feeling of, I don't like it. If we can recognize, I just don't like it, and then breathe right into that, then we don't have to do so much of all of this other stuff, getting a redneck and tensing the body and then watching the body and then relaxing it. That's, again, what we talk about in the sense of letting go. Letting go is something that people do after they're clinging. Let's hope that we can do the real letting go is way before we're clinging. You can yeah. see that, that once I'm clinging to my anger, once I'm already angry, then letting go of that anger is hard work. But if I just recognize, for instance, that I don't like the way that things are going right now, let's take a deep breath and figure out what to do about it rather than springing into anger, which is the automatic or the instinctual way of doing it. Yeah. So all of this has to do, again, with sati, with remembering. Can you remember? Yeah. Can you remember to watch? Can you remember to see these feelings? And once you're able to see feelings as they arise like that, then also we start to have gratitude for that. Wow, I'm really glad that I can now begin to control my feelings simply because I can see them. Yeah. And we can change our relationships with other people that we don't have to behave the way that we have normally behaved. We can behave in new ways because we're mindful and we're searching for new ways of, of doing things. We begin to experiment. And we also have the ability to gladden the mind. That's the real trick. Or actually yeah. not not to gladden the mind, but to remember to gladden the mind. Yeah. it's. Um, I've noticed recently that while sitting, um, so when... Like, the very first thing I think we ever talked about was sitting down to watch the breath and then finding out that it's that the mind wanders away and not liking that. And for a long time, that was still a pretty big deal for me in terms of how much I didn't like that. And I was kind of <laughs> on and off, like, dealing with, like, gladdening and then forgetting to gladden talking to you again, you would tell me to gladden the mind, I would kind of remember for a while, and it would kind of go back and forth, but um, recently I've noticed that I don't even care that much anymore, like, the mind wanders a bit, and I'm like, okay, I noticed, but I have this really important thing to do, which is focus on the object, so let me get right back to it, and not get sucked into any like, it's like, I, it's not that I, I, I still don't want it to wander, but like that reaction of, I don't like it doesn't come up. It's more of like a, Good. huh, a Good. thing happened. Let's, let's go back. Ah, uh, that's great improvement, but let me stab it in the heart. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> that, okay. And here's, I'm going to do that. The wandering mind is the normal state of the normal human mind. Get over it. Yeah. <laughs> That's the normal state of mind. And yet when people begin to meditate, they begin to hate that, which they recognize is just, that's the way things really are. Why do we go through that hate stage? Yeah. Because you're now trying to get get to the place of acceptance that, yeah, that I don't really like it, but that's kind of how it is. And I would like for you to move beyond that to be completely satisfied with the fact that, yeah, the mind wanders away. To, be, to take that with complete satisfaction. 
so that now we can put all of our time into joy. Ah, yeah, I see you. I know what you're like. That you're just a human mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's an important point because all of this has to do with attitude change. And we become satisfied with the way things are. This, by the way, is, is actually in the Anapanasati Sutta, but like so much of the stuff in the suttas, it's all in a one-liner that needs to be deeply, deeply unpacked. Now, it is possible that in the time of the Buddha, the one line was enough because everybody already understood what they meant by it, and now we don't because we've suffered through society and language and, and uh, meaning changes and whatnot like that. But in the Anapanasati Sutta, there's a line that says that, that one of the benefits of Anapanasati is for the development of the, of the power through the basis of the power. And then we recognize that the basis of the power, and by the way, in the Pali, the, the word for power is idia, and that the base of power is idiopada. You hear the word pedestal or pedal in there, and you know that it's an Indo-European language, and you say, yeah, I got pada. Just like patichu, uh, excuse me, um, uh, sati, patana. There's that same word again, all right? It means foot or footing or base or... Um, yeah, I've heard it as, as foundation. I've heard it translated. Right. Well, uh, in America, it depends upon what part of the country is. Some people call it a foundation. Other people call it a footing. Yeah. Sometimes on one side of town or the other. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of interchangeable. Right. So foundation or footing. And in fact, you can see the word foundation and footing comes from the same word. And then when you recognize, oh, there's this relationship between the letter F and the letter P in these languages, and we wind up seeing, oh, the word foot is actually the same word as pedal, and the word foundation is actually the same word as pedestal or as uh, patana and all of that. It's just the way that words evolve. Mm -hmm. But it, it goes back to the same roots in... Uh, it looks like that it's in Greek, but it actually goes much further back than that. We don't know, really. It's possibly the original language of Mesopotamia, because we do know that uh, with the cuneiforms that there came a time in, in the city of Babylon, which gave rise to the idea of the Tower of Babel, Babel and Babylon, that they had a lot of cuneiform, they had a lot of schools, people learned to write. And the, and the whole civilization was very literate. But then it fell upon hard times. The schools were closed. And within two, two generations, nobody could read the cuneiform writings anymore. And that was what the story of, of Babel is all about. But the point that I'm making is, is that more than likely, that language that they spoke was actually an Indo-European language because that's where the cultures spread from. Because that's the oldest civilization that we know of is the Sumer civilization from 3000 or so BC. But anyway, it's remarkable how much similar the languages are. So, back to the idea in the Sanskrit or in the Hindi uh, Hindu ways of looking at it, the cities are actually magical powers. But with yeah. the Buddha, the idea are powers are actual powers of the mind. That's the actually really confusing. <laughs> the fact that idea and city is both translated to power, that's really unfortunate. I can see that causing a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. Well, they're actually the same word. You just pop an S on the front of it and there you go. <laughs> Yeah. Just like Dhamma and Dharma and Kama and Karma and uh, <laughs> so many other words. But yeah. the, the point is, is that the, the powers that we're talking about are mental powers that through these four bases, which are actually also the four items 
that are on the Eightfold Noble Path of right mindfulness, right effort, right view, and right attitude, these become the bases of power. When the right view becomes uh, intentional investigation, sati is already there, investigation, putting the effort in to doing it, and, and having the right attitude about it, that was what's needed to develop which I already see budding in you, these powers. And what are the powers? Let me list them for you. Most of them start with the letter S in English. One of the powers, and this is a remarkable power, and by the way, these powers that we have are normally associated with really, really powerful people like a king. All right. So let's look at him. One of the things that King should have as a power is he should have a big army so he feels secure and safe. Another power that he would have is he, he feels successful with his army. So he has success. He's satisfied with his kingdom. He's secure. He's content. He's satisfied. These are the words that we give that have real power. Now, the thing of it is, is that these are mental skills that many, many people who were put in the position of actually being a king don't have these powers. And they wind up being really bad kings because they don't have the real powers that a king needs. But when a king has all of these powers, but guess what? If you have these powers, that makes you a king also. In this case, the king of your life. This is part of what the idea of a unified mind is. That you're, we're not a crowd anymore, torn by this way or that way, or indecisions or doubts, or maybe of this or maybe of that. When we feel satisfied and secure and content and safe, secure, satisfied, and successful. In fact, it looks like that the word successful is the predominant word. And Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa talks about it a lot in the sense that successfulness is one of the keys to joy and happiness. Well, we can see how that operates immediately when the mind wanders away and we can see it wandering away that's the point of time to gladden the mind, say, success, success. Yeah. The mind was wandering away, and I didn't know it. Now I know it. That's success. And so over and over and over again, the gladdening of the mind is adding to that layer and layer and layer of being successful one after another until you start laying down an entire attitude that your life is successful. That yeah. your life becomes satisfying and, and satisfactory. Never mind that the mind wanders away sometime, but I'm satisfied with the mind that wanders away. Why? Because I can be mindful of it. Yeah. So in, in let us say, modern uh, Western Buddhism, I hear the word acceptance a lot. And I view the word acceptance kind of like that we would view the word tolerance, that we're tribal, but we have to tolerate other groups. Don't really mm -hmm. like them, but we'll be nice yep. to them, yep. okay? So we, we're, we tolerate them. One level down from that, or let us say at 50% of toleration, is acceptance. Okay, I'll accept them, but I still have, I don't like it in there. Yeah. Grudgingly. All right. So to all the way down then, at the, at the bottom of that, of acceptance, is satisfaction. That I've come down to the point that really it's okay. Instead of coming yeah. to a dead zero, we'll actually go to a .01 plus. <laughs> Just to make sure that it's no longer negative. Yeah. So we become satisfied. And so that should be a goal as well as, let us say, a skill to be developed of satisfied, to learn to be satisfied with how things are. 
And so now you can add that to that list of things to be mindful of so that eventually you'll start to have gratitude for the fact that you do feel satisfied with things because that's a really nice feeling of gratitude to be really, really happy and grateful that you can actually accept the things the way that they are. Acceptance in the sense of satisfaction. So these are the powers. And these powers are developed alongside of uh, everything else. In, In fact, you could say that these powers wind up being one of the ways of viewing Anapanasati when it's practiced correctly. Is that these new mental attitudes are formed. And these new mental attitudes are, in fact, all associated with being a king or being a lion. And none of these uh, new uh, attitudes, none of these powers reflect us being a victim. Oh, poor me. Oh, please help me. Oh, I can't. All of that stuff has been overcome so that one becomes mentally a lion. Now, in this case, it's, it's a metaphor. I do not expect you to grow a mane. So yeah, it looks like know. you're trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's one more word that I'm going to add to this list, which is right in line with this uh, theme that we're on about gratitude and, and, uh, and generosity. And that is the word wealth. Mm-hmm. To learn to feel wealthy. When I say learn to feel wealthy, what we're talking about is the developing of the skill of being in a mental state of being wealthy. And one of the ways that we can develop this is by practicing generosity. Yeah. Because so long as we think that money is tight, we're not wealthy. So long as we think we don't have enough, we're not wealthy. But when we start practicing generosity and to say, oh, I am satisfied with what my purse is after I give to somebody. And if I can give it in a way so that they receive it with gratitude, then we both get a nice jolt of joy. Yeah. And we make the world a better place by practicing this combo of generosity and gratitude. Yeah. And that's exactly what's supposed to happen at the at the watch and temples when the people come to feed the monks. They get great joy in in uh, performing these services. And so, um, at least when it's working more correctly, sometimes it doesn't. But in any case, this idea and the idiopada is. Uh, the the skills to be developed and the benefit. This is part of the fruit of the path that we begin to feel or actually do feel and are in the habit of feeling satisfied, grateful, generous, wealthy. And so at the level of step, let us say, the seventh knowledge then for the soda pond, the full completion of the uh, path, uh, path through the fruit. So the final fruit then of the soda pond is in fact this enormous joy and gratitude, gratefulness, uh, generosity that we have because we've got the Dhamma and we know we've got it and yeah. we can see the benefit of it. Yeah, now you're in the stream and kind of... And now you're in the stream. Take, taking you further along with it. Oh, actually, maybe it's not even taking us anywhere. Maybe it's just a whirlpool. That's okay, too. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. I've really... So this is kind of something we ended on last time we spoke two weeks ago which is the whole generosity practice and 
I've really put more energy into that over the last couple of weeks and months. And it's really nice. It's, it's nice, but um, it's re really unusual. And I'm not used to receiving that kind of gratitude coming my way. Like, um, like doing something for other people and then they're just insanely grateful and it's almost difficult to handle because um, I've never had to handle that before. So it's a completely new situation for me. Uh, I guess it's a good problem to have though. Yes, it's an excellent problem to have, except it is not a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're making it into a problem, partly because you're saying, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, is that yeah. in there? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's that's a that's a whole whole another can of worms, though. Well, that's the victim. I mean, it really is a can of worms, isn't it? Yeah. Who are you to say that you're unworthy of the gratitude that someone wants to heap upon you while you bring generous? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm not I'm not struggling with that as much as as I might have made it out to be. Um, right. Well, you'll get used to it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's but that's it's, part of the practice, okay. though. That's the skill development is getting used to things. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Tell me some of the uh, um, episodes or tell me some of the um, the happenings. So, as you know, I'm living in a in a dormitory and yeah. we, we have a shared kitchen and mm -hmm. like shared bathrooms and stuff. And um, I've just like this is a really small thing, but I've just been buying all kinds of supplies for the shared spaces and just putting them there for people to use. Um, like, this is not like hundreds of dollars or anything, but it's just nice to have, like, there's a real tendency here for people to be very secluded and very, like, hyper-individualistic, where everyone locks their doors all the time and, like, people lock away the food that they're storing in the kitchen and I just kind of wanted to counteract that. Like, yes. I'm not, I don't, I, I don't lock my food in the kitchen and I think someone stole some of my food, but then I just kind of made that into a donation, like retroactively. Um, so I'm just, I'm trying to kind of make it into more of a communal space by kind of supplying stuff that everyone needs and just putting it there for everyone to use. Um, uh huh. That's kind of kind of the the kitchen thing going. Um, well, that's an excellent practice. So, what what benefits or what changes have you seen in people because of that? I've definitely had people uh, approaching me and saying that they're grateful that I'm putting the stuff there. Um, they were like, "Hey, is that did you do that? Is that yours?" Um, and so I said, "Yeah, it is." And they were they were pretty grateful. And I just observed myself kind of trying to minimize my, like, I immediately started saying, oh, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Like that kind of <laughs> being, being unable to take, take that gratitude. That was like, I wasn't prepared for anything like that being said to me. So that was kind of my, my initial reaction. But yeah. All right. So next time, if that happens again, somebody asks you something, you can say something along the lines, yeah, that's my thing. I'm practicing that. Yeah. And then and they'll <laughs> ask you a question or so about it, and that'll lead you into telling them what's going on. I've been, I've been operating under the policy of not discussing practice with people unless they specifically kind of ask out of their own kind of, Thing because but they will if you're out there demonstrating it yeah with your generosity they'll they will i'm i'm pretty 
um, hesitant because I know of my own tendency to kind of become like like um, to to become kind of full of myself and think of myself <laughs> as this great enlightened master. I mean, not really, but like as this like skilled meditator and I have so much to teach and I'm so like generous let me teach you all the wisdom that I have so I'm trying to counteract that by like not talking about it at all and just keeping my mouth shut as much as possible um, okay well um, one of the things that you can start looking at then is uh, according to the concept of the middle path that you might want to start opening up a little bit knowing that in fact that there is a danger that you can get over your skis or that you can start being the big guru in the house or whatever like that which you don't want to do but that you can you can find ways of letting it kind of leak out okay I'll experiment and i was with that. i was right and i was and i was uh, kind of experimenting with one of those so when they see your generosity you can say yeah it's something that i'm practicing or yeah. it's something that I, I I I hope that you enjoy it, and then yeah. they can ask, then you can talk a question about it, and you can say, oh well, it's um, the whole idea about generosity and gratitude is kind of a Buddhist thing. Hmm. You're kind of uh, you're kind of reeling them in. I can see how you're <laughs> how you're kind of. Uh, in a very innocuous way, kind of getting people acquainted with that. Yeah, you'd be surprised, but people do know more nowadays. Yeah. In fact, when, if you said something like that, that generosity and gratitude that I'm practicing is called of a Buddhist thing, they'll agree with you. They won't say, I don't, I don't think so, or I never <laughs> heard of that. They'll, they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard that, yeah. 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 So um, another thing I've but, been doing. But is, please don't invite them to go to church with you, whatever that church is. <laughs> oh, okay. I've been I've been handing out. Yeah. Like, you should talk to this guy Damarado. He's awesome. Like, giving people like small cards with your Skype address on it or something. Um, no. No. I, I was. I was. I was joking. <laughs> well, again, with the middle path, I would not expect you to be out there doing that in the sense of proselytizing because we don't. Yeah. But there might be someone that you do talk to that that might, in fact, be exactly the right thing to do is to give them my Skype address. But only if they want it. Yeah. I think one thing that's really powerful is kind of I don't know what what that's called, but kind of leading by example. So instead of like proselytizing and like really getting into people's face, how good mm -hmm. this Buddhism thing is, is kind of just becoming a better person. And then hopefully people exactly. will kind of start asking like, huh, I noticed you're not such an asshole anymore. What happened? Um, that's that's my hope at least. Well, it will happen. In fact, uh, you're already uh, showing, let us say, showing the benefits that actually impact them. That the the, con the quality of generosity is like that. That it really does sort of rub off on people. If you continue doing that there, and that they and everybody there kind of gets the hint or the idea that you're actually doing that and you're doing it intentionally you may find them not locking their doors so much. Yeah. Or they may be leaving more of their stuff out and around. That in yeah. fact, as you, as you show yourself trustable, they'll begin to trust you more, and then they'll begin to trust each other. That's what's really going on, is nobody trusts anybody anymore. To yeah. where in fact the reality of the situation is, is you guys are living in a family together. You're living in the same nest. 
Yeah. And you still don't trust each other. Wow, that's it's heartburn. A, <laughs> it's a hu it's a hugely dysfunctional family if it is one. But yeah, I agree. It's, well, that's the American way. <laughs> there's a whole lot of. Um, I think it's based on fear, where people are afraid that, like maybe stuff would get stolen if they left it out, or, like people would break things, or. Um, but I feel like there's such a huge cost to kind of constantly having to worry about that, that it offsets any material stuff that might go wrong. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like having to live in a space where it's like, I've seen people go, go to the bathroom, which is like right across the hallway and then locking their door for the duration of that. Because they're like, and that that just seems seems crazy to me. Yes, lack of trust. So, showing open generosity and receiving the gratitude. You might also find ways go looking for the things that they do that you would, if you were spot on, would be grateful also that they're doing nice things for you that we normally. Yeah don't look at and so you can actually build that uh, together the gratitude and the generosity together so that the people in your in your family can learn to trust each other now that would be a wonderful benefit and you don't even have to use the word Buddha or Damarato or anything <laughs> yeah Yeah. Well, I'm really pleased to hear your your success. That's really great. Continue on with the practice of of generosity. That's wonderful. Recognize also you might in fact already begin to see the benefit that if you're in a household where everyone is afraid, everyone is uptight, everyone's locking their door, everyone's hiding their food away, and you're out there with your food open, that actually should demonstrate both to you and also a bit to them that this is a kind of wealth, that you feel wealthy enough yeah. that you're not going to be diminished if things are taken. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, so you're already getting the benefit of this generosity. You're beginning to feel oh yeah. wealthy. Yeah, I've actually had the thought that this culture, I mean, is making it really hard to be generous. And I was having a lecture the other day where um, basically they were talking about how in business, anytime someone says they're giving something away for free, it's either a scam or an insane person because no one ever gives anything away for free. Like this whole idea of um, like strangers being nice to each other is just not something that's very compatible with, with the culture. Um, and I, I actually ended up like, I, which is kind of a thing I wouldn't have said a couple of months ago is I would love to be to, to have more easy opportunities to give give people stuff because it's a really nice thing like easy nice opportunities to kind of give stuff away or kind of maybe give a gift or um, but people are like it's it's not common it's not what's supposed to be happening according to the dominant culture mm-hmm Yes. Um, have you seen the video, The Century of the Self? It's a four-hour video. I think that I might have given it to you at one time. Is it on YouTube? Yes, it's on YouTube. I haven't Century seen it. The Century of the Self. All right. The Century of the Self is actually a very, very long sequence, a four-hour uh, documentary that shows the exact progression that you're talking about and that they start with Sigmund Freud because it was his nephew um, Edward Bernays 
yeah. who actually took the teachings of Freud and turned it into what I would call industrial psychology, which is how business uses psychology to manipulate and turn citizens into consumers. Yeah. He's the father of advertising, right? Yes, exactly. And so you can see that this whole culture that the Americans are in is supported by that. And it's, and it's nothing but a greed model, but they, they call it capitalism and then talk about how wonderful capitalism is, where in fact that kind of capitalism is nothing but selfish, completely selfish, based upon greed and fear. And no one winds up happy in that capitalistic kind of world. That doesn't mean capitalism itself is bad, but when it's the only thing that we've got, people wind up being unhappy with their whole lives. And you can see that in the behavior of the people that you're living with. Yeah. That they feel insecure. It's not that they lock their doors and then feel secure. That's yeah. not how it works at all. They yeah. lock their doors because they feel insecure, and they still feel insecure after they've locked the door. Yeah, it kind of doesn't really address the problem. Doesn't, locking the door doesn't address the problem. That's only a symptom. Yeah. Now, the other thing that, you, that we can understand also is that it's really not a problem. That's the way that the world is. The world is scatterbrained. And so you have to give them the same benefit of the doubt that you have to give yourself in the sense of being satisfied. That that's the way that that's the world you live in. And so individually, we each have to develop the skills that we need to live in this, this mental minefield that everybody else is in. And we'll have to sidestep it to keep from getting blown up in the same explosions they're setting off. But meanwhile, the U.S. is a minefield. Yeah. And everyone's already a casualty of at least a thousand bombs have gone off under their feet. And that's just how it is. But you can still be very kind to them, very compassionate with them, but... You have to see that they're suffering. That's the main thing, is to recognize that this is you live in a world of suffering. Everyone around you is suffering. And if you see it that way, you can, you can begin to have great compassion for them, which you express with generosity. Yeah, that makes sense. Hmm. Well, if it makes sense, then now all you have to do is remember to do it. Yeah, it's really hard. Um, <laughs> another thing I've been I've been trying to do is also be generous in terms of speech. So, one thing I've really noticed is the tendency to uh, not really listen to what other people are saying, uh, and instead, kind of, while they're talking, think about what you're going to say next. And That's very common. Like the whole thing of someone um, reports that they have a problem and instead of reacting with compassion, what I usually do is kind of, huh, I've had a problem before, but it was much worse. Like, <laughs> like kind of one-upping one their, their pity and, and kind of so I've been seeing that through the lens of, of compassion and as well to kind of just listen to people actually. <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. turning out to be much harder than one might think because it's <laughs> so deeply ingrained and you find you just, I find myself um, kind of speaking um, unskillfully and then kind of having a moment of mindfulness after that. So. Uh, mostly it's it's kind of waking up to something that's gone wrong, but uh -huh. in increasingly... Well, that's become... the second best time to do it. Yeah. In increasingly, it's also sometimes before I start talking and then um, 
kind of having that little like let me just think about what I'm going to do for a second and then and then start taking that time to take a deep breath or two is really worth it that'll give you time to uh, decide which general direction you're going to take so always when that kind of thing happens the best thing to do is to <gasps> Hmm. Sort of mull it over. And yet in the Western culture we have the idea that I've gotta I've gotta I've I've gotta perform. Yeah. When they're talking, I gotta get ready so as soon as they shut up I can take over. Yeah, it's really and not I have compassionate. To, because if I don't, they'll think I'm an idiot. <laughs> and and both people there are trying to out talk each other with the idea that if I don't win this, the other guy is going to think I'm an idiot. Yeah, especially when it gets to talk about politics or religion or contentious issues. Well, I don't have to worry about all of that because I know that they are an idiot <laughs> if, they're, if they're going to take something different than the Dhamma's perspective. <laughs> Therefore, it's, the best I can do is, is make jokes, which I like. Yeah. I don't have very many Buddhist jokes, though. But I've got tons of Christian jokes. In fact, there's <laughs> libraries full of Christian jokes. How come there's no Buddhist jokes? Are they too sincere? Too stern? Um, actually, in a way, you could say it's too precise to where jokes actually require a change so that you can set something up and then deliver something complete. It, uh, jokes are generally based on a bait and switch. So they have to be set up right. So Christianity is right because they already have all of this belief system. And the main joke is, this is what Christianity believes. Look how stupid it is. Yeah. And we come up with at least 10,000 jokes like that that don't fit very well with Buddhism. <laughs> yeah. Because it's really hard to see how stupid it is when, in fact, practicing it, it doesn't look stupid at all. It looks like, hey, this is a general article for the first time. That, by the way, is part of the pen, a part of the um, pendulum fulcrum. Fulcrum is the word that I'm looking for. Imagine that, a, that there's a teeter totter, uh -huh. and that um, the teeter totter is on the ground on one end of it and you and you stand on that one end and then you start to climb the teeter-totter until you get to the middle of it while you're climbing to the middle of it it's an uphill climb but then as you balance yourself the teeter-totter now turns over and the rest of the journey down to the other end of the teeter-totter is all downhill from now that's very much like the way that it is with soda pond. And this point of view or this fulcrum or this, this middle point is the middle point when we recognize that there is no other teaching quite like the teachings of the Buddha. Yeah. That only the Buddha's teaching is a liberating teaching. Only the, the understanding of suffering and no suffering. Because all of the other religions are based upon a system of right and wrong, good and bad, good and evil that are defined by some god. To where here in Buddhism you're, it's completely up to you and that you have a new set of criteria rather than following a rule that you've been told. You've got to figure it out for yourself. You've got to watch what's going on. That point is a major shift in one's understanding. Because up until that time, and with most people, an example would be we're trying to protect the self. Which means if we've done something wrong, we want to hide it. We don't want other people to know that we're an idiot. But once we come to understand there is no self, 
and that if I am trying to protect the self or I'm trying to hide my wrongdoing, that's suffering. So in order for me to be free from suffering, I'm going to have to start up being honest with myself, especially about my own wrongdoing. This is where it begins to become fruit. This is when a student really gets benefit out of it is because he's willing to look at what normally he didn't want to look at. So are you saying that it's kind of an uphill battle of sorts or an uphill climb until uh, soda pond and then from there it's it's uh, going down like uh, downhill I would, slope? I would say also that it's not just soda pond is uphill but it's that midpoint in soda pond where it's uphill that the second half the fruit of soda pond is all downhill and that the uphill journey that the top of the uphill is when we finally realize for 100 percent sure that my life is based on the four noble truths now my life is based on suffering and no suffering my life is no longer based upon desires, is no longer based on doing what I'm told to do, is no longer based on doubts and maybes and worries and whatnot like that. Now I've got it. My life is only suffering and no suffering. Yeah. And that's that then that's that pivot point. After that it becomes all downhill because now we know that the, the life is easy. There's no reason for life to be hard anymore. Life is easy. All I have to do is stop walking in the dog piles I've been walking in. I have to be mindful. I have to watch where I'm going. Every step of the way is a mindful step. And that's the only thing that needs to be done, is develop these skills of mindfulness and right uh, view, right uh, attitude. And that's all that it takes. And after that, it becomes a downhill. Now, at the, the final stage, or step seven of, of, of the Sotapan, is when the Dhamma is so well known, so well understood, that it becomes kind of a unit. That before, when we're figuring out the Dhamma, it's like there's bits and pieces of Dhamma, like a jigsaw puzzle, all over the place, all over the floor, trying to fit things together. But by the time one is finished with the fruit of the soda pond, it the puzzle is put together completely, and now there's just one picture. There's only one thing that Buddha really does teach. Only one thing. And that is suffering and no suffering. Everything else about the teaching of the Buddha fits right into that little Chinese package. And it feels <laughs> wonderful. You've got it. You've got it nailed. You put the puzzle together. You got it figured out. Great yeah. joy, great satisfaction arise. Actually, on the, I've been having some interesting um, discussions. I mean, discussions is the wrong word, but um, conversations about what stream entry, so soda pond, is actually all about. <clears throat> and so, one thing that it sounds like you're saying is that it has also to do with attenuation of suffering so this kind of doubt falling away does lead to suffering falling away to an extent as well exactly so however i've also heard it said that kind of uh that's actually not what happens and that's actually what happens with uh, uh with an anagami only like with uh with the kind of next next step on the way but that's not that's not the view that you have right no my view is the first breath you should have joy <laughs> and it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds okay now one of the major distinctions between the soda pond and the anagami is that the anagami knows how to control his feelings so he can feel the way he wants to all the time that that's the main difference is the feelings that the soda pond only has the skills to deal with the feelings 
the soda the anagami is one who has the skills of having dealt with his feelings and so yeah. naturally he's even going to be at a higher state of happiness because yeah. he can manufacture the stuff out of <laughs> out of magic dust yeah okay yeah that's good because that's also the way I had understood it before that it's it's not like that the soda pond is not only some sort of intellectual realization like in terms of um, like the view of self as an intellectual concept falling away or doubt on an intellectual level falling away but that it's also directly related to the kind of experience day to day in terms of actual actual suffering falling away even at that first like even at the level of soda pond um i'm i'm kind of curious about the word falling away because i look at it much more in the sense of development yeah okay Falling away is something that a Christian would say. As if some god or some magic loosens the bond and then gravity took over. But I didn't have anything to do with it or I'm just trotting along down the path and the stuff just falls away. That's not normally what happens. And one of the ways that you could say it like that would be... Hmm... Imagine that we're talking about rather than uh, the, the path of the Dhamma or the path of the Buddha, we'll talk about the path of the violin. And so there are noble violin players. And when you would talk about like the soda pond, a noble violin player would be already an exquisite musician. But when the this musician is still just a little bit of a student he really hasn't been on 91 world tours yet and so when he plays the music he wants to make sure that it's deadly accurate because he knows that very many people who are for instance, an example would be a particular violin concerto like the Tchaikovsky's violin concerto really a beautiful piece of music very very difficult to play uh and yet both the soda pond and the arahat or even the anagami would be able to play this but the arahat and the anagami are going to be much more playful at it because the student the the soda pond is still having to think about it he has to remember he has to work at it he knows that his job is that i've got to play this piece absolutely correctly and i got to watch what i'm doing every minute every second every note but the anagami had done that so many times now he can do that and it's almost child's play so not only is he in front of the orchestra playing that masterful piece of music so beautifully, he's also just dancing. He's really enjoying what he's doing. Okay, but both of them are excellent musicians already. That's the one of the things that you have to kind of understand. That's what makes them noble. That's why a soda pond is noble, is because he's got that task of being Johnny on the spot, he's got to watch every note. He knows that that's his job now, and he happily takes on that job. Yeah, I see. So he Deep. actually does become quite an excellent musician, but it hasn't quite yet become natural. It hasn't quite become completely playful. Yeah, there's more work to be done at that point. Mm -hmm. And there's still more work to be done. Exactly. Do you find that... So another thing <clears throat> I've been wondering about. So do you... And I don't know if this is... I've never heard you talk about this before, but 
the so the actual event of becoming a soda pot. I've never actually heard you talk about that before. And it's because it's not an event. <laughs> it's a process. Yeah. So you're saying there's no... So what I'm getting at is the whole Maga Pala thing. But it's not really an event. That that fulcrum point doesn't happen at one particular moment or a particular point in time. It would be kind of more like a plateau. But I know that the Western mind really thinks of it like that in the sense of events rather than process. We also, because of our languages, think of things in the sense of nouns and conventional language would be the kind of language that we have, but a real Dhamma language, if we had one, would be mostly, if not all, verbs. So that's the way to look at it that's more understandable, is, is that at no point in time of these seven knowledges is it a one-off event. Let me give you an example of the first knowledge. That the very first time that a student sits down and sees the mind wandering away and he's taken enough of Goenka to where he says, okay, never mind, start again. And so now he starts to watch the breath again. That is actually a very minor, minor, minuscule first knowledge right there. The first time that people recognize the mind has wandered away from the breath and they bring it back, that's the budding. But now uh, the full first knowledge is when the student comes to kind of a profound conclusion by looking back over time that no matter how obstructed the mind is, I can clean it out no matter how much. And Danny was talking about that one time very beautifully when he was having recurring, recurring thoughts about the day in the sense of everything kept going wrong. And when it happened, he would have the thought, this is a bad day or what a bad day this is or this is a bummer. But then immediately Sati would kick in, bump him in the butt and he'd say, oh, no. It's not a bad day. Oh, no, it's not a bummer. And I'm very happy that I could catch that myself. And then so the next day he called me and he said that he was actually able to catch that happening about 30 or 40 times throughout the day. And every time it happened, he got a great big kick out of it because he knew now for sure that no matter how obstructed his mind could get or how often it would come back to the old crap, he could see it and kick it back out. That's a major event in one's life, that first step. And that's, in fact, what the Buddha calls the first step of nobility. One is, in fact, on the noble path after they take that first step. They are, in fact, a soda pot. Because they've taken the first step of soda pot. And that first step of soda pot is, is that I can clean my mind out and I can come back and I can be here now. A lot of people don't even know what it means to be be here now, where in fact they spend a lot of time in the here now without even understanding that they're in the here now. It's no big deal. But when we're lost in thought, that is a big deal because that's prone to suffering. And when we recognize I don't have to be lost in thought, I can come back and I can be here now and I can do it happily. And we do that over and over and over and over again until we're absolutely sure that we can continue to do that. Then the next step is when we can reach the first jhana and maintain it. So in the beginning, the mind wanders away, we see it, we bring it back to the breath, it falls away again, we see it, we bring it back, then it falls away again, we see it, we bring it back, it falls away again, we see it, we bring it back, and now it starts to linger and stay there longer before it wanders away again, and when it does, we can catch it quicker and bring it back. So we start to spend more and more and more mental moments in the here now 
and fewer and fewer of them lost in thought. And when we get to the point that we can keep the mind in the here now for long stretches of time, that's first jhana. And what it means is, is that we can apply and sustain the mind on whatever topic we want it to, that it doesn't have to slip off into lost in thought. Now we have the mind fit for work. And in fact, people be, in modern culture, we don't think much about this first jhana. But you cannot read a book without being able to keep your mind focused on what you're reading. And that's exactly how people read. They read something and then their mind wanders away and they wind up being not very good readers. They fail to read it, but they're not reading at all. But when we can keep our mind focused on the reading, then... We can gain that knowledge because we're paying attention to it and we can keep focused. Well, that's exactly what we want to do with the mind most of the time is to keep it focused and fit for work and not all lost in thought. But when it does get lost in thought, it's just going back to its old natural state. Never mind. Come on back, boy. So that gives us the second knowledge, is when the mind is fit for work, you can apply it, keep it focused, sustain it, like reading. And then the third knowledge is when we're going to take that mind that's fit for work and put it on the Eightfold Noble Path, the Four Noble Truths, the Second Noble Truth, look at what's going on, and figure out the path of the mind and how it works. And once we are focused on that, then we can begin to live our lives in a way that's free from suffering because we're beginning to study suffering. That's the third knowledge. The fourth knowledge is when we already have it in the sense of now I know what the job is and that is suffering and no suffering. Let me be dedicated to that. And so step four and five and six and seven are all processes and that process actually is a a sliding path downwards into devotion and dedication to the path. So that when someone is absolutely dedicated and devoted to the Eightfold Noble Path of the Buddha, they don't they know it and everybody else does too. So we don't have to go around wearing labels about soda pond and whatnot like that. I think that Westerners are well uh, too much in, into labels. And so they're looking for the soda pond being an event to where, in fact, if we're going to keep the word event in it, it would be the seven events at best. But really, the eradication of the doubt about what is and what is not the path has to be done over and over and over and over and over again. And not one of them individually is the point that you can say, that was the time that an event happened. But rather what happens is, is that we reflect back and recognize, oh yes, somewhere during the past idiot time, I have come to the conclusion that no matter how much my mind is clouded with uh, with adventitious defilements, I can clean it out, which would be the first one. So that's the way that we want to look at soda pine. It's not an event. It's a, it's a series of processes. And it takes time. It takes mental skills. It takes development. And the development is based uh, as much on these four qualities of the Eightfold Noble Path or actually just the path itself. Each one of them can be considered a skill. But we also have, along with the the skills of doing that, we develop also the skills of uh, idia, the powers, so that we do feel successful in the Dhamma. That's really an important point that we can do. It's very much of a can do.
So it's also you can see that coming out of the position of being a victim into being a winner, that's not an event. That's not a wake up call that happens or a clarion call or a bugle call or whatever like that. That's a real process that someone has to go through that we could go so far as to call it growing up or maturing. So becoming a soda pond, this is a good example. When is a child, when do they become an adult? When in the sense of, is there an event? Is it when the little boy first jacks off? Is it the bar mitzvah? Is it when he gets drunk the first time? What is it? And we recognize, no, his first off is all of those things, and second off is not any particular one of them. But it's a maturing process that happens. Does that help you understand it? Yeah. It's Yeah. Um, I'm I don't know if this is skillful or not, but I'm <laughs> I'm always trying to kind of understand um, the difference between how different people talk about this and there's a lot of different descriptions about this right so depending on who you talk to you could get wildly differing um, definitions of what what soda pot even is um, so that's kind of why I'm why I'm bringing up like alternative formulations because by seeing like the differences between what you're saying and what other people are saying it kind of helps me understand it more if that makes sense. Hello, you're still there? 